very much, and I, I'm sure you're wondering why I'm going to speak about ethics with a background in electrical engineering. But <clears throat> I think that uh, this is such a, a multidisciplinary subject. It's usually a subject that people care about, and I think everybody in the team needs to know something about it. So this is the, the structure of my talk. Um, I'll, I'll get through to maybe a couple of examples if I have time. Uh, so why do we need to consider ethics uh, in mobile health? Uh, uh, back in the 70s, 80s, uh, Mark Weiser uh, predicted this whole uh, paradigm of pervasive health as being uh, the third uh, sort of uh, 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 bit of computing going from mainframes to micros and now uh, effectively sensors embedded in the environment and uh, the environment uh, basically with us in an, a symbiotic relationship where it knows a lot about us as well as us measuring. Um, and this came uh, to me yesterday when my wife sent me a text saying, are you enjoying that pint of Guinness? Uh, <laughs> which uh, I had no idea how she imagined I was drinking Guinness, except that my photo to a colleague uh, had uploaded to our, our shared photo page. Uh, so, uh, all this is happening by our friends Google in the background, and we have to be care careful about both the data we record and the data that we share or have shared on our, our behalf. So, as in all universities, we have a policy. Everybody has to adhere to the policy, and the policy really is to protect the staff, particularly in terms of doing research that's properly formatted research, uh, and that can then go to peer review and publication. And more and more, uh, we're seeing the situation where if we haven't done the ethics properly, we will have a problem with publication in the long run. So, I'm on our ethics committee, and I see lots of these applications coming in, and they're applications for smart home applications, uh, for self-management applications, and uh, we always have these debates about what category these should be uh, categorised under, where people always want A, which is effectively very little ethics, and in our case it can go to category C, uh, where we have to refer them on to a further committee, usually if that involves, uh, in our case, NHS patients. Uh, sometimes when we're dealing with vulnerable people, we're in between, where we have what's called a Category B application, where we have to really take into account uh, the use of the technology involving vulnerable people. So general ethical principles, we would all uh, sign up to these and uh, adhere to them, respect. Uh, uh, we want the research to do good rather than harm. Uh, we want to treat people fairly. We want good communication uh, between the research team and with our uh, colleagues, with our uh, uh, subjects. And the last one there is trust. And in fact, trust is very important here because uh, if we lose trust, that becomes a big problem, particularly if we lose trust uh, with our end users. Uh, so for example, one of the dilemmas we would have in the ethics committee is when do we actually remove data? And I'll come to GDPR uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, if, for example, a person wants to withdraw their data from a study, after having signed up to the study. Now, on the face of it, that's pretty straightforward. You simply remove the data from the study. Uh, however, in computing, we might have used this data to build models. Uh, those models might be part of somebody's PhD. It could be late in the third year of somebody's PhD, and we're now being asked, can we remove this data? And that in itself, uh, I think, poses an ethical dilemma, because our position up until now has been, no, we can't remove this data. We can stop collecting data on the person who has previously agreed, remove their current data, but not the historical data, because that's part of research. So it's always a balance. 
Okay, again, general things we would sign up to, research involved in human participants. We should not have any harm, be it psychological or emotional, physical of course. Uh, we should not coerce uh, students even into taking part. Uh, it should be completely consent driven. Uh, but how do we get consent from people who are not fully able to give consent? This is a big problem. And of course, risks, advantages and disadvantages have to be, be made clear. So at our university, I'm sure it's the same in all universities now, we have to sign up to this integrity. We have to have a little certificate to say that we have gone through a course and we have been trained in all these issues to do with, uh, with uh, research ethics. Uh, nobody will have failed to have been uh, part of this whole 25th of May uh, GDPR process uh, that in my inbox seems to have made no difference whatsoever. Uh, I, I specifically decided I wouldn't opt in knowing that I could do so later. Doesn't seem to have had any effect. Um, so if you summarize what GDPR says Okay, consent there is clear. We, we would do that anyway. Uh, we'll, there's more specific uh, comment on subject rights, breach notification, rights to access, right to be forgotten, so to remove your data, and then privacy uh, by design. So we have to build this into uh, our experiments now. However, the way that has been interpreted yesterday even uh, I was at a, a meeting, in fact it was the day before, I came down here yesterday, yeah, the day before I was at a meeting in Ulster, and um, we had this huge debate, and it was in the, the nursing college, as to what GDPR actually meant, and there were two completely different views. One view was that all the data collected in EU projects could be used for research, providing it was uh, completely anonymized, and this came from uh, an EU meeting in Brussels. Uh, anonymous data can be used for research, that's for the benefit of all. Anything funded by the EU should be treated in that way. Right down to another view was that assent could not be assumed anymore. That if you could not get fully informed consent uh, to take part, uh, then a clinician had to actually give that assent. And in fact, we even had a debate of who could be the clinician. We have researched nurses whose job it is in the Northern Ireland uh, scheme to involve themselves in research. Uh, specifically, that's their job role, and apparently they do not, uh, uh, they're not classified as the clinician in this case. So, although this is supposedly clear, when you actually interpret it, it is actually not that clear. And one of my colleagues was told from Brussels, get yourself a lawyer. Uh, so this will probably come down to some test cases. Okay, what I want to do, if I have time briefly, is just go through a couple of cases where we have been involved with uh, the ethics process. The first is uh, a self-management platform, and this we call Keep Well. And we are all well aware of the whole problem of chronic disease. Uh, the incidents in the community, how it's going to get worse. And one of the, the hopes is that we can self-manage uh, chronic disease. So if we can use behavior change, uh, we can actually provide some, some good and we can use technology for that. So there is a lot of evidence. Jane started off by talking about evidence today. There's a lot of evidence out there. We have had previous projects you can go through and you can find loads and loads of evidence uh, for chronic disease self-management. Now, uh, this debate is very current. For example, uh, the IEEE, uh, we've already heard of NICE guidelines and uh, different guidelines from WHO. We now have guidelines from the IEEE that is really the engineering uh, body responsible for a lot of standards. And just May, June this year, uh, they have a website where they're, they have sought comment and now they have published guidelines for prioritizing well-being 
uh, with autonomous and intelligent systems. So this is, you can go and have a look at this now. Again, most of the stuff that we would see here, we couldn't really disagree with. It's just when we can, can get down to uh, the details. So human rights, well-being, accountability, transparency, awareness of misuse. So, uh, we had previous uh, projects, Smart 1, 2, and 3, where we had actually gone through the paradigms. We knew effectively how to use the technology. We knew how to build apps. But this latest project was actually to try and take the technology uh, from uh, the research lab and try to effectively commercialize it, to go through with it uh, right the way through to a company. And where we tried to differ with this compared to the plethora of wellness apps uh, on the, the Play Store, for example, is to make this clinically relevant. And that poses another problem as to uh, who uh, underpins that evidence. So this is just general self-management. So we had three conditions we were looking at. We were looking at COPD, uh, which we seen as preventative. We could try to prevent exacerbations. Dementia, which we seen as accommodative. We would try to ensure that uh, the appropriate uh, reminders, etc., could be given. And stroke, which we seen as trying to effectively restore some function. We use standard off-the-shelf uh, technology, and I note that uh, one of the other colleagues here has used very similar technology in a poster. Um, and the idea being that at the end of this project, that technology would be available. But we've already heard of the pitfalls of changing in versions of the technology. This was Withings technology. It has since been bought by Nokia. And uh, there is a problem, there's potential problems with updating repositories, etc. So we started off uh, with lots of functionality. Uh, this is what uh, we sat down. I'm not going to go through this all because it's mainly about the ethics, but we, we wanted to look at lots of functional, functionality for stroke, uh, functionality for dementia, and functionality for COPD. So we went through with stakeholders. The problem is when we actually got down to build the app and then trial the app with uh, uh, groups, we found that most of this technology or most of the uh, functionality was not required was not desired, uh, and that the functionality collapsed back to being much more uh, straightforward uh, functionality. So we ended up pretty much with generic requirements, uh, generic requirements about wellness, about education, uh, and about self-monitoring, about setting goals. Uh, so a, a lot of what we desire to do as academics, I think, is still uh, not quite ready for the market. So this is what we ended up with, uh, an app where we had uh, goals, we had self-report, we could look at progress, we could set reminders, and we could provide uh, education. Now, one of the dilemmas, and this uh, persists as a dilemma for us, and it's, uh, I think, part of uh, GDPR as well, is that in order to record this information using a commercial off-the-shelf uh, device, that device uh, uploads its information to the cloud. So we're already in a position where we're not totally in control of the data that's being acquired. Uh, the way we interact with the device is we suck the information back down from the cloud and then uh, add on to it, add functionality to it. Uh, however, uh, there is the potential for secondary misuse of the information by the device manufacturers because they have access to the information recorded. So that's a, an ethical dilemma for us. Uh, we populated, again, uh, this was clinically val validated work. We had uh, clinicians be behind this and, and good expertise. So we tried to use the best state of the art in terms of providing, for example, education. Uh, goal setting, and then measuring uh, the appropriate metrics for the condition. 
Okay, so, so that's what we've, we've done with the app. We then decided uh, that we needed this to get out into the community, and this was funded by InvestNI. Uh, so they were very interested really in generating wealth. That, that's what they really want to do here. So what we did was we uh, produced a vehicle, and that vehicle was to interact with their healthcare professionals. So we have had some engagement events with healthcare professionals, but that in itself is a difficult process. I think this was alluded to earlier. Uh, the healthcare professionals are all extremely busy, and their time is precious, and setting up th these meetings in itself is difficult. Uh, these engagement events, and I think it's very important to get to the healthcare professionals for this technology to be uh, eventually used. So again, we have issues both with the development of the technology and then with the use of the technology. And we try to keep within our ethical uh, framework in terms of uh, consent, uh, privacy, data security. Okay, uh, there is another issue here which is one of involving people uh, and one of the, the, the worst cases here would be consent in people with dementia. And uh, this has been the subject of a lot of debate in many of our projects. And in fact, uh, there is an involved statement uh, that says that really the, the end users can be treated as co-participants and can uh, effectively influence the research. And in that case, we don't see these people as end users as we would in a, an RCT. So therefore, uh, that removes some of the ethical dilemmas for us, that they are actually the experts in, um, in their own field. So this comes from the Alzheimer's Society. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so what I, I really want to do is just quickly talk about something, something else that, uh, maybe involves other areas that uh, we're, we're not really clear about. One of them uh, is a, a research area uh, which is related to mobile health called brain-computer interface. And uh, th these are really difficult questions. This guy on the left was in the news a few years ago and uh, he wanted the right to end his life, which was tested in the courts and not granted. We have the guy in the top right-hand corner is called Lou Gehrig. He was a Yankees baseball player and de developed uh, this disease of locked-in syndrome. And then we have Jean-Claude uh, Bobby on the bottom right. And he wrote his memoirs simply by blinking his eyes. Uh, that's the only way he could communicate. So you're, you're locked in, uh, but you have cognitive facilities. So we have a technology called brain-computer interface that allows us to interact with such people. And that, that's one of our areas. But what this does is this starts to have what's called a shared autonomy. That if you're linked your brain to a computer, it's very hard to know when you're in one of these experiments who is making the decision. Is your brain making the decision or is the computer making the decision? And that, that's a future area that I think is going to be fascinating. Uh, because the way we view the future is that uh, humans are going to be amplified with intelligence. They could be more powerful than AI. We're going to have people who are completely in the zone, back to the, the sports science. We could have people who are tuned in, who are going to hit the, the gun on the, the 100 metres. Uh, and that's how people generally uh, think how uh, this technology could enhance us. Uh, however, there's another view of technology uh, and we have a project which is uh, human symbiosis, where we interact with uh, a computer. And in fact, what we do is we use the human as a peripheral, because the human really is looking at repetitive visual stimuli, and they can do that quicker than a computer can at the minute. So therefore, they can make a decision based on that person's a terrorist uh, quicker than a computer can. If we link them up to the computer and show them lots of images, uh, then effectively the human is now subordinate to the computer and is no more than a scanner or a mouse. 
So, so these are some of the decisions that we're going to have to, to uh, view in the future. Okay. This is a, an area of lots of different disciplines. I think uh, we are in mobile health here and in this conference, we are right at the center of all these intersections of the different disciplines and we need all these different disciplines uh, to advance mobile health. And then we have uh, the downside. Uh, no need to, to go on about uh, Cambridge Analytica, except that it no longer trades. <laughs> and this is my final slide. And GDPR, uh, we have all these things, do you want to hear from us? And I generally say no, and I hear from them anyway. And then I was in church the other day, and I picked up the little leaflet uh, in church, and just about here, uh, you can see somewhere, you probably can't read it out, but it says, due to the changes in GDPR regulation, <laughs> the names of the children baptized in the parish will no, will no longer be published in the parish bulletin. <laughs> so, presumably, uh, that is in case uh, in later life they take an action. Uh, now, the one thing that it doesn't say that people that were being buried were being treated actually different. <laughs> Now, I suspect that's because they cannot take an action. Um, so what I've tried to do is raise some of the issues. There are lots of issues, and that they might come up in the, the panel discussion. Okay?